Um, so yeah, I'm Richard. I'm from Darwin. Uh, you might have seen on the uh, all the flyers and that. I'm from Charles Darwin University. Oddly enough, my um, card says Digital Mojo, which is where I work. So I'm not sure what I am. At the moment, I'm sort of in between. Like I'm doing a bit of uni, doing work, but I don't really associate myself with any particular place. So I just go by a program and designer sort of thing. Um, I was quite proud of my title. Um, it might read out quite literally, but it was actually supposed to be a pun. You know, where you place the joint with point. Um, but I, when I read it out to my dad, he immediately thought I was going to do a presentation on pot. So, yeah. Um, I know, right? I even had the idea of doing like a nice anvil animation with the pot, but I, I, I just settled with that. So yeah, here am I. I've I'm in person from Darwin, and I've been to three dev worlds. I've also been to a create world, but I mean, who else has been to a create world here? So, oh, a couple. So, that's cool. Um, obviously, they're interested in games, um, but it's not just playing. I really like to actually uh, analytically look at games and see what makes them fun. So, I'm often looking at um, uh, critical reviews online, like for instance, game trailers, where they they don't just give you a review, oh, the game was crap. And they actually sit down and they break down what makes the game fun and all that because I think it's good to have a good understanding. Like in the same way like when you go see movies, you have like a critical review as opposed to just, oh, the movie's crap, not worth watching sort of thing. Um, and um, going back in a bit of time, I actually used to do a lot of, I suppose, obscure things. So uh, I used to uh, emulate games in Flash because, you know, you could do that, you know, like make make all those cool little Game Boy games you like and that. And I've actually done some emulation and stuff, so I've done a bit of things. At the moment, though, my job is more web-based, um, so that's front-end as well as back-end, so I've dabbled in server-side and shopping systems and that sort of stuff, so it's quite, uh, you know, varied from my interest in games and what I actually want to do sort of thing. Um, yeah, and if, if you know of any Darwin-based websites or events, I've pretty much touched them all in some shape or form. So, uh, yeah, in, in the past three years that I've been working at um, Digital Mojo. Uh, it seems I have a double click. So what I'm going to cover, um, so this, this is based upon um, early days of iOS, at basically straight after the dev world last year. So, so there might be some stuff that's updated now, which uh, might make some of my things out of date, but yeah. And I'll be particularly looking at uh, SK Joints in Sprite Kit, um, because as I'll go into detail. And um, this is going to be based on Objective C. Um, I'm aware that Swift does do some of this, and they have got the code up on their website. But uh, for the most part, it actually isn't that different. It's just a different declaration with a different way of writing. So what I actually will show you in terms of the joints can actually be directly converted to Swift. Um, with very little sort of um, change in your code. Um, and I'm also going to show it in an early game concept of a little hobby game I've been working on. Um, it's very early though, so don't expect anything more than square boxes and placeholders. <laughs> um, and also, um, I don't do iOS as a main job, so uh, it's a hobby and uh, as, as it is, my main thing is web development, so I've done a lot of other things like Java and ActionScript, so um, my code might be a little bit messy, and if you have issues with that, it's not my fault. <laughs> so yeah, back, back last year in the dev world, iOS was brand new. Most of the uh, talks at dev world were um, about iOS 7, and one of the new things was SpriteKit. And um, as some of you know John Manning, he did this awesome, awesome presentation on um, Sprite Kit, where he made an entire game in an hour. It, w it was really, really good. I mean, he obviously had the code, but he was still putting together, constructing it, and he even had graphics in it at the end. And it was, it was just like, wow, you know, with this Sprite Kit, maybe I could actually make this game I would want to do, because um, as a developer, often you, uh, when you look at making a game, it's like, well, what's composed of a game? You need to have an engine, then you need to you know, build the foundations up so then you can start making the game. Whereas a lot of times you just want to get straight in and start building those levels so you can sort of test to see if things work or not. Um, and part in the past, whenever I've made games, or at least tried to work on it, I, have to, I, I do it right from the scratch. So I build an engine, 
Um, and, that, and I can show you one, uh, one example of this, um, with one I did with HTML5 later on if you want. Um, so yeah, on my flight back to Darwin, which is a nice long four hour flight, maybe not as bad as some of the New Zealanders. Um, about the same? About the same? Okay. Um, yeah, I mapped out my entire game. Um, there was also a couple other presentations last year. Um, this one, hey Tony, what was the, uh, the dude who did the crab game? What was his name? I don't know. That sounds right. Yeah, John Millard. Um, one of the cool things he, he talked about in his was the uh, pricing model, I think it was. Yeah, and um, I, was, I was quite liking that because most of us, when we look at in-app purchases, we think, ugh, in-app purchases are those ugly things that we have to sort of deal with that, that they're plaguing a lot of apps these days. And um, when I sat down, I sort of thought, well, if I had in-app purchases in the game, like, how would I like to actually pay, pay for those things? So, um, yeah, I, I sat down and figured out you know, a way that at least for me personally, I'd actually like to pay, um, uh, which I can talk about later, but that's sort of, if, if I get through all this other stuff first. Um, so in, in, in the basics, the game I had was a physics puzzle game. So um, the basic core is you'd have, you utilize an object, sort of like Angry Birds, where the birds are a, a, a physical object where you're fleeing, but in, in the sense is that the object can be replaced with a different sort of mechanic. So, um, an example would be an arrow, a bomb, a sword, shields, elemental arrows, obviously Zelda related, because you know, I like Zelda. Um, and, and yeah, and the idea is to get the key so they can unlock the cage to advance. So, because there's a, a princess which is um, captured on every single level, so that, that's like the end goal. Um, and so, sort of the, where these ideas have sort of come from is obviously Zelda. There has actually aren't very many Zelda games which are done on that 2D sort of thing, and obviously the only Zelda game was um, Zelda 2, and it was not that great. Um, so, but the other influence obviously is, um, particularly with the key thing, is the Donkey Kong and the Game Boy, um, which I thought of because, uh, except with that one, it's a lot more platforming because you actually got to run around the level, get the key, you know, play around. But the, the core concept of where you've got to get that key to that lock to finish the level is you know, where, where my game sort of sits. But the, the way the game works is a lot like Angry Birds, where it's physics-based, and once you set off that initial um, touch interaction, the rest of the you know, you know, action is uh, um, controlled by physics. Um, you don't have a lot of control over that. So the proof, proof of concept is, because uh, I want to see if this actually works or not, is to build a very simple level. So fire an arrow, cut a rope to drop a key, which will then unlock the cage. Um, but it's actually quite complicated if you sort of break it down and think about it. Um, so I was, I was looking at the Apple documentation, and particularly during that early iOS 7, it was, it was pretty bare bones. Like, uh, I think it, it was almost, particularly with the joints, they, sort of, they gave you a declaration and that's it. And even now, I don't think they've really changed. Like, there's not like nice, really good examples of, of the code and that. So, um, especially if you're not really familiar with joints and physics and lots of stuff, it's quite um, hard to get into. And also, when I was looking online, because like th things like you know how to fire an arrow in, in physics is quite a complicated thing, the way other people did it didn't quite translate across to Apple because they've got their own sort of way of doing things um, with this whole custom sprite kit setup. And also, John didn't record his talk, which was a disappointment. Like, I waited about a month or so after DevWall, hoping that he'd put it up so that I could watch it again to sort of capture those little bits of um, information that he gave out. Um, and even then, I went onto Stack Overflow looking for help, and there was very little, particularly on Sprite Kit joints. Um, I, th I think I even found an article where John Manning was actually asking for help. So this is, this is to give you an idea of how little information was out there for it. So. Um, this is obviously still 2013, maybe October. What was Devil? Can't remember. Um, but that's the link of, for the Apple documentation, which is in the PowerPoint. So obviously not much else out there. So it was trial and error. Um, first thing I came across is that the coordinate system is um, pretty scary because I, I suppose with, with, particularly with um, UI interfaces, the coordinate system is basically the top left-hand corner. It's not like that at all in SpriteKit. It's all I think it's mostly based upon the center, and then you have up, down, left, right, but I think going up is actually plus, going down is minus, and then right is plus. So it's, you know, 
it, it can get confusing. And then when you start adding things like anchors and stuff, it, it, you're dealing with all these different um, coordinate systems, trying to get the right calculations for where things sit so that they properly, and I'll show you why in a, in a bit. Um, and also there was actually a bug. If you put a certain line out of order when you constructed your um, objects, they actually wouldn't um, render properly and they wouldn't work. Um, and that was the first thing that stumped me, and I think it stumped a, lot, a couple of other people too, um, when, when they're trying to figure out joints. And yeah, as I said, anchor points are a bit fiddly. And the other bit is with physics is that, say for instance, you properly set up all the objects, you run your scene, it'll just sit there. There's, it won't do anything unless, of course, you've applied some sort of thrust, which is a separate little thing again, trying to understand how thrust works and that. So it's sort of like, well, how can I test to see if the physics are actually working? So um, what I would have liked is a way for I could quickly go in and, and play around with it to actually get it to move in that. So, but the cool thing is that Sprite Kit does a lot of work for you, which is which is good. So like I didn't have to worry about creating an engine that was already done. I mean, with Sprite Kit, it's almost a matter of create a new Sprite Kit game. There's your engine. You can just start adding stuff to it. So which is really cool. Um, so yeah. Uh, after a bit of trial and error, I came up with a function, because my goal obviously was to do that rope level idea, uh, where I was able to create a segment of um, a rope things, because looking online, I found that was the most common way people approach doing a rope where you could cut it. There were separate segments, which once you create a collision, it then cut the rope at that point. Um, so yeah, and what I created was the spaghetti monster. Why? Well, I wanted it so that way when I created the function, it didn't, wouldn't matter where point A and point B are, it'd be able to generate a string of rope nodes between them. So that way, if you wanted to have a rope going to the left or to the right, I could. And the easiest way to do that was to create a loop where you just do it around, you know. I've actually got a demo of that later so I can show you and, and why I call it the spaghetti monster. So, so I'll start going through the joints that they had. So they've kind of got five types. They've got fixed, sliding, spring, limit and pin. And this is the diagram that's applied on the documentation, um, which makes sense when you look at it, but it's sort of like, it, it's, it's, it's sort of hard to visualize that unless you've got a good understanding of joints and all that, so, and I don't. Um, in fact, I, I took a physics class, um, a high, high school grade physics class in, in university. I failed it. In my defense, it wasn't the physics that I failed, it was the electromagnetism, so. And the teacher was a big fan of electromagnetism, so. Um, so I'll go through each one. So the first one is fixed. Uh, now the Apple description is a, a fixed joint fuses two bodies together at a reference point. Fixed joints are useful for creating complex shapes that can be broken apart later. So um, here's a block of code to show you a really basic where you've got two objects and you've created a joint between them. One thing I'll note is you'll see how I've got object nodes. So what I've done is I've actually extended the, the basic sprite node and just added a, a, a few touch interactions so that way I can move them around while it's in live demo, um, which is a cool little thing I figured out. So um, what I'll do now is I'll bring up the demo and just show you it, each one. And see if it works. It's MacBook Air, so it might be a little bit slow. Okay, so we've got two joints, A and B. And if we move around, they're not really doing much, they're pretty boring, but that's a fixed joint. So they're locked together. Um, and I suppose the way you probably use this is when you've got like a really complex object and you want pieces that maybe when there's a collision, they might break apart. So, but you don't want them to move at all. So that, that's a fixed joint. And um, if you look at the code, where are we? Fixed joint level. So you basically, you're constructing your two um, objects um, and applying their physics, it's, it's um, pretty straightforward. If, if anything doesn't make sense, just let me know. Um, but you create two objects and you create an anchor point. So what I've done is create an anchor point at the bottom of the first object. And um, so it's, it's in between those two, so it's locked like that. And as you might see here, it's quite complicated trying to get the right location relative to the two objects. So uh, it's like there I've got uh, body point. That one's a pretty easy one, but some of the other ones, they can get really complicated with how to get the correct location for the joints so that they move in a particular way. Um, so we're going back to presentation. A dynamic property. Uh, okay, so um, in physics, uh, you have dynamic and in dynamic 
or at least in sprite kit. Dynamic means that when the physics are turned on, it, it, it's a type you just pop the box right there in the middle of the screen. When dynamic is turned on, it'll immediately fall. So it, it is affected by gravity, basically. That's the core bit. Uh, when it's not dynamic, that means it's, it'll lock there and it won't move. Even if something hits it, it won't move. So um, examples of why where you'd use it, say going back to that, that rope on the, on the thing, you'd have a hook up the top which holds the rope in place and then the key is, you know, they're, they're, they're all dynamic hanging from that hook. All right? Um, it's, yeah, good. I, I didn't sort of think of that. Um, so yeah, that's uh, fixed. Actually, bring that back up again. So next one is sliding. Sliding joint permits the anchor points of two bodies to slide along a chosen axis. Um, so again, is the code um, in the thing, and I'll go through each bit. But if we open that one up, sliding joint. Okay, so when I move it this time, it moves a bit differently. So the um, the joint is on obviously the y axis. So that means it'll always. Um, keep up at the same way. So, so even though I'm moving this left and right, it's staying in the same spot, but it's matching. So um, I haven't quite figured out a, a good example of what you'd use this for, but I suppose it'd be like, particularly in maybe a mirroring sort of instance where you're trying to mirror something on a particular axis. So um, you know, they have those puzzles where they might be mirroring their actions. But I suppose when you get to that level, you might be wanting a, a bit of other mirroring code involved. But you know, um, that, that's a different sort of joint. And it has two other parameters which you can apply to it. So it's not spring, sliding joint. So we have um, these limits. So what that means is that when you're moving it up and, uh, I think it's left and right the, on the opposite one, it'll prevent it from being too far apart. So like if I enable these lines, it's also got a, a Boolean, which will then, so, so they, you can set the limits, but you can have them disabled. So that way, if, if depending on how you're uh, running your code, uh, you can then toggle it on and off depending on what you want to happen. So when I move that, it's got a, a 30. So obviously, my touch code is a little bit buggy, but it will, or it should. Yeah, so it, you see it, it, it will only go that far apart, and then it'll start to follow it on the left and right as well. So that, that's what you can do with a, a sliding joint. Uh, okay, so going back to this. So the next one is a spring joint. So a spring joint acts as a spring whose length is the initial distance between two bodies. Um, again, the code's in the slides, so if you happen to want to look at the code, I can give you the slides for that. Um, you, you might notice that the, uh, the, the two bodies, the code is almost exactly the same. I've intentionally done that so that you can see the, the difference that it makes by this change in the joints. Um, so if I bring that one up, and this is where having that, that basic uh, uh, subclass is really cool because I can actually grab this and then start flinging it around, which is something you can't really test with just a pure render, render it as it is. And, and another thing too is I can grab this one, I can swing it around, so you can really sort of see what the spring joint is like. Um, and you notice it's really, really springy. So if we actually go look at the um, attributes, it's got two. Um, again, see those descriptions I've got in the comments? That's all Apple gives you about them. So unless you actually know what these things are and what they do, you've more or less got to play with them. So um, the frequency is uh, basically the way I've interpreted it is it's the springiness. So if I, um, I think if I lower that, it becomes less springy. I mean that that's uh, it's still pretty springy, but I think it, I think it's 0.5 is when you start to really see it. It depends on the uh, the the scale that you're doing it. So you might have seen I had that density. Yeah. So that's obviously got a really bad. Um, oops. Sorry. So it it, it, it is there, but it, you see it's a completely different sort of um, way that way the physics works. And it's obviously the uh, the stretch is obviously much more with a lower frequency. Um, I don't quite understand what dampening. I think dampening is to do with when you've got other objects and it collisions, it's how much it loses its um, momentum. So um, I mean, if people can sort of can 
clarify that or not, but it, I, I sort of find when you have variables, you just play with them, sort of see what they do, and, and if, if it happens to be what you want. Um, I suppose from the point of the rope, you think, well, why wouldn't you use something like this, or maybe the next one, which is called a limit. So it's almost exactly like a spring. The main difference is that there's none of that stretchiness. So yeah, a limit joint imposes a maximum distance between two bodies as if they're connected by a rope. So and I think initially when I was thinking of doing my thing, I was thinking of using this one, but I'll explain why I didn't. Um, so yeah, again, code's almost exactly the same. You might note there's two anchor points. I think that was the same with the, uh, the, the spring, is that it takes two, two points um, because, because you're connected with this invisible uh, rope, I suppose you could call it. Uh, let's just bring this up. Limit joint. So you see here, does not stretch at all. It sort of just moves around. It definitely sort of moves like it's on a rope. So um, I can grab that. And, and, and it will only go a certain distance. So you know, if, if there was like a platform there and I popped it on there, it'd stop and then it'd like, it, it, you'd be able to bring it closer and all that. Um, it'd be good if, if you want like a basic sort of rope thing, but I'm not quite sure how you would go about, um, I suppose, generating the rope in place of it, because you'd have to somehow figure out how to draw a rope string over the top. And then again, how would you collision that? I, I suppose in a simple way, you could just do a straight line. Uh, I suppose I think it's like cut the rope. And the moment you cut the rope, it just disappears. So that's maybe where that sort of a limit would be really good, um, but maybe not in the way I'm sort of using it for my game. So we're moving on to the next one, uh, is a pin. The pin joint point pins two bodies together. Bodies rotate independently around an anchor point. So this is the one I actually use for my rope. Um, and I'll just bring it up to show you it. Oh, sorry, I'll show you the code as well. Again, code, code is here um, on the PowerPoints. You see it's got a couple of other um, variables you can use to um, limit the way it moves. Um, I haven't really refined how these work that well because they're a bit tricky. So he, here's um, two parts. And so this is a pin joint. You see there, it, it's, it's stuck to that point right in the center of the bottom and it moves like that. And you notice it sort of it hits the point and then it immediately falls back down. That's what these um, where are they? That's, that's what these limits are for. So you have um, a limit on the left hand side and the right hand side, I suppose you could sort of say it, or lower, lower and upper. So it's a, the minimum and maximum. So it will only go up to there and then it'll fall back down again. Uh, and the friction is um, every time it touches something that is limited. But in, in the way I've used it for that, um, for because it's so close, uh, it, it immediately sort of catches on the other ones. So I haven't, I'm not, not sure how the Torg, would you pronounce it Torg or Torg, Torq or something? But yeah, um, it, it basically restricts how much uh, friction applies to limit that sort of motion. Okay, so moving on to the next one. So now uh, I've, I've now sort of figured out how do joints work, sort of. I've got my spaghetti monster rope generating code. So again, going back to that initial concept idea of a level was to create, create a rope that I could cut to release a key. And the physics pin was the one I chose uh, to make up a, a string of rope segments. And the, also the arrow, you need to figure out how the arrow had an initial applied thrust, so that way when you pull it back, you can fling it and it actually moved like an arrow. And um, the thing is, you can do that with an object, but then you've got to uh, calculate, like with an arrow, when, when you fire an arrow, it does a nice arc, car, arc curve that actually doesn't um, move by default in sprite kit. So I actually did do a frame by frame uh, uh, block of code, which will then calculate the rotation as it goes in the arc, so you get a nice smooth arc. Um, and yeah, if you don't understand physics, it's quite hard to do. It's good if you can find a bit of code that'll sort of you can just copy paste it in, but not a lot of Apple code, so you've got to port it across. Um, I can show you the code for it as well. Um, uh, and the other bit too is that when the rope actually touches a segment in the, um, the rope uh, object, is it has to figure out the closest joint in the rope and then cut it at that point, so that way you get the nice cut, clean cut. Um, 
and, and then obviously once it hits a wall or something, it's got to stop because arrows, they don't hit a wall and then bounce off. They go into the wall and they stay there. So um, it's another little uh, thing you have to account for. So here's a screenshot of the uh, concept of that. So, and I think I will bring up the example. Oops, wrong one. So, so now, now I've got my, um, my rope and I've got a, a touch spot here in the same sort of way you have in Angry Birds and I can get my arrow, rotate it and it, pulling it back like this, although it's not, I haven't actually got it animating so you can actually see the strain, I've actually got it in the console showing how much strain is being applied the further I pull it back and I release it, fires and it stops. So if you see there, got all this messy and it's log stuff showing you how the angles and all this is quite complicated and I don't know how I figured it out, but you did. So, I'll, oh, I actually cut it. Damn. My joke's gone. So I was intentionally going to try and miss, but because, you know, as you saw, I could move things around. So, you know, miss. I'll move it down there and then I can cut it. But, yeah. As you see, um, my cutting ropes isn't that awesome because it's obviously cutting it in multiple places. Um, it's an issue I'm trying to sort of figure out because uh, once you cut it, it's still touching objects. Like it's still generating that event. It's touching another object. So you've got to find a way to disable it so it's not going to cut anymore. Um, it, at least it's not cutting the top bits. Because I think initially when I did it, it hit the rope and the entire segment would just split apart. So uh, that, that, was, that was fun. But yeah. Um, and the other cool thing is once you start getting your joints together, you can sort of play around so I can like move that around and get a nice swing or like not that, you can sort of swing it around. See that it's, it's very springy, so it's obviously needs a bit more tweaking, but this is where that, ang that angle limit helps because that way you can sort of limit how much it moves. And while this is all in boxes, once you get to like maybe graphics, you could probably hide how um, I suppose crude it looks with the um, the way way you generate the graphics. So um, yeah, but obviously it's got to be a bit less springy. But I think the main reason it looks so springy is because I've got that able to move it around sort of interaction. Whereas your general sort of like if I was just to pull it up there and move it, it's actually quite solid uh, in in the way it moves. So um, yeah, so bringing this back up again. So yeah, I managed to achieve my basic prototype. Of being able to cut a rope, so um, so yeah. Obviously, this year Swift iOS 8 came out, and um, it's obviously going to be a lot easier to program. Uh, they've actually got the declarations for the Swift versions of all these things on those documentation pages I had links for. So uh, you can essentially grab the code I put up there and just replace it with Swift version, and, and it would work exactly the same. Um, yeah, it, it, it translates almost correctly. Um, but it's, it's, as, as this is a sort of like a hobby for me, it's been quite difficult to sort of keep up. Like, um, I was also running off of the hype from last year's DevWars, so I was like really into it. And, and yeah, sort of, when there's not, no, no support for documentation, I, had, was, I couldn't find any sort of examples. It was sort of a bit of a, a killjoy. It's like, I want to do this, but I can't because I don't know how. And, there's no way I can find out how because no one knows. And um, yeah, and funny enough, I, I, the most work I've actually managed to get work on developing all that rope was during a class I found really boring. So you find your little your little developer moments where you can sort of sit and focus. Um, and yeah, and uh, I, ideally, I last last year when I had this game idea, I wanted to set it that I would have a prototype ready for PAX. That didn't happen, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, I think going to things like PAX, DevWorld, and some of the other ones, I think is really good because particularly if you have other things that sort of get in the way of those hobbies, um, it does make it hard to sort of continue to work on them. Um, and, yeah, and for me, it's, it's, it, it sort of sounds a bit like a slack thing, but it, it is quite hard to sort of sit, sit down and devote time onto something like this, um, particularly like if you work in IT. You're on a, t on a computer all day. You don't really want to sit down at home and work on a computer again. So um, that's an issue. I mean, it's, it's cool for the uh, the secret lab guys because 
they're like making games all the time. So, oh, that's the impression they give off. They may not, but um, yeah. And obviously, yeah, f go, to, go to these things to find other people with different interests. So like, I can actually do art, and if you want, I can show you some of the concept art I've been sort of doing for this as part of uh, another unit. I, so I, I try to sort of double up, you know, I have an idea. I'll use several units to do, do work on this, so I've actually devoted time to work on it. Um, but I'm not a true artist, so it, you know, I've got to find another artist who has, does the art I want. And at the moment, I think the stuff that's closest to what I want is what the uh, you know, Secret Labs Leonardo game looks really awesome. It's like a point and click adventure. I want that artwork. <laughs> it's really good. Um, so yeah, my contact details. Um, I do have a Twitter, but I don't use it. So um, yeah, if you want to ask me any questions. And you might have noticed the background. That's taken from Destiny. I'm a big fan of Destiny. I've played a lot of it. Um, and if you happen to be on PS4, please. Add me. I'd be more than willing to play pretty much any day. Um, and yeah, it, it's, it's, you, can, you don't even have to play it. You just sit there and just set up the sky. Because they've actually got artists that have sit down and created these like time lapse of, like the, the skies will change like from, you know, like, uh, what do you call them? The auroras and, and, and then you have skies. And you go up on the moon, there's like a destroyed space station that's shattered across the sky and it slowly moves across. And, Oh, it's, it's just awesomely beautiful. All right, so um, going back, I mentioned the spaghetti monster. So this was the initial test. Cool thing when you're trying to figure out how these physics work is it gives you ideas for other stuff, hence why I've called it spaghetti monster. So this is a, um, he's got a few less legs, but as you saw there when he initially started, he, he was a bit floppy. The, the one I did in that original screenshot, I had the, uh, the, the, the angle limits really tight and because they were um, so long it was sort of like like a slinky I suppose but in spaghetti it was like moving around all jiggly and I'm sitting there cracking up laughing because it's just the way sometimes the physics work so like if I move this around he's, he's got a little bit of personality there but as you see like if I get it he, get, he gets a bit caught but the cool thing is I can sort of move that out of the way because you got that touch um, I can show the code for that too but it's, it's sort of when, when you're trying to develop um, these like functions for the other things they give you ideas and so yeah it's like I might do something where I have like a a joint where there's a lot long things like that because it's kind of cool and um, like if I was just go to the code for that and I just added like a few more segments maybe to eight I think it is oh. okay mate I think I think the um the rope's a bit fat um but as you see there it's sort of it's like a completely different sort of thing by just adding those few more joints and mm. he, he does look a bit sad but you see because of that restraint it's trying to force itself back into the correct position so it's, physics are fun once you've actually got them in a way that you can actually play with them um, which is cool but as you see here looking at that code um, it's to do it I think it's uh, trigonometry and stuff and it's quite mm. I used to be good at trigonometry but not so much anymore um, so, yes. Um, any questions at all? No one's to know any particular things or me to go over anything? Um, I'll just show you the. Uh, sorry? Oh, my concept art. Uh, all right, so I did a, um, a, a basic, I think it was like a live drawing, but I ended up convincing the teachers that I should do concept art for a game. Um, as, as I mentioned with the motivations, it's, it's, you know, you have any issues trying to... So I didn't get a lot of work done on it, but I sort of did get enough to sort of tr construct together a basic... Um, like, like, like all the bits in place to actually, actually see without those objects. So like I did some arrows. Um, what's the game? Uh, the one with the four knights you can play. Uh, I don't know, I think it's done by the, 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 the company with the big bird in their logo. I think they did Alien, um, Alien Hominoid, I think it is. Yeah, yeah, it's Castle Crashers, yeah. So I sort of liked the way their the backgrounds sort of were, so I sort of uh, did a couple of those up. Bow and arrows, play it, pause buttons. I might have a few screenshots somewhere, so hooks. I didn't get a lot of concept art done, so I still passed the unit, so that was good. Um, yeah, a little crappy night and some rope segments. But um, 
like just even crappy graphics, get them in there. It, it's a huge difference over the top of like just square boxes. But um, as you can see, you don't need gra graphics to actually at least get something working. Like you, you can get a visualization with just the square boxes, as like John and um, Paris have said. Um, yeah. I wonder if I might, I might have, let's have a quick look. I, I sort of commented out um, all the graphics because it was a few, like it sort of interfered, you know, the touches, they sort of, that they, they get overridden when you add sub uh, nodes and that in Sprite Kit. So I sort of removed them for this. Oh, where are you? BCC, view, creative art, selective. Uh, Screenshots. So yeah, that, that's just a, a mock-up of all that graphics all in place to sort of sort of see it with that same sort of level. Yeah, not not. Um, I sort of I know what sort of like visuals I want, but I can't draw them. So sort of, so like I, I did like I, I did. Uh, I looked at a whole bunch of other games. To sort of, I, I'm a big fan of that whole sort of point-and-click sort of hand-drawn look sort of thing. But yeah. Um, I might just show with that object the overriding the, um, the SK node. So I think it's in the, uh, yeah. So I, I've added these three touches began, touches moved, and then in the main class I've, I then um, whenever it touches an object I then call these, and so all it does is it's just a basic drag and drop, and I also I think it's here I just apply. I, I get it to run the, the physics for a, a split second, so that way it applies rotation that. Because if you just move things with um, the dynamic turned off, they won't rotate or anything. They'll just literally move left and right. So you apply a quick uh, frame or two of the, um, the physics, and then it'll probably rotate them. So that's where, when, when you're running it, you get so a little, oh, sad little thing. So you see when I move it, it actually sort of rotates and all that, and that's because I'm actually applying a quick frame every time it moves. So, um, yeah. Uh, and, and I'll just show you the arrow. Just, just to show you how complicated it is to sort of, uh, where is it? Arrow, it should be there. So. Uh, touches in, touches move. Oh, sorry, it's rope. Okay, so here's my rope function. You see, it's quite a bit of code. So it's, it's, it's sort of, you have to sort of uh, figure out the distance. So that's trigonometry. Uh, the distance between two points. Um, then you have to get the angle. Then you have to figure out how many segments that are combined into it. Obviously, then create a loop. Um, and then you have to do some uh, stuff where you're ca calculating the next point for the next uh, segment. And then obviously, applying rotation. Um, it's, it's quite complicated. And then, then of course, you've got to then deal with the different, um, uh, as I saw in the coordinate system, so, uh, so the anchor, it, it's, it's got your origin x as well as the applied distance for that segment in the, the string of segments. And um, I think whereas the actual position of the element is, is slightly off, so when I was initially doing it, the, um, the, when they rotated, they weren't rotating on those set points, they're like rotating halfway into the other element because the um, center point of each object is actually the center of the object as opposed to left and right, top and bottom. So you've got to apply that relative to the object and then to the scene. Um, there's, there's unfortunately a lot of Apple, at least as far as I've seen, not a lot of Apple documentation sort of, you know, because it can be quite confusing when you sort of say, okay, I want a thing in the X position and it's sort of up there somewhere. Why? Um, but yeah. Any other questions or anything? No? OK. How yeah, did that go? It was pretty decent-ish. Yeah. Would anyone like to see my HTML5 engine? Yeah. Yeah. So a um, couple years back, I did a project unit. And I basically wrote an entire, um, or at least the bare bones of a game engine in HTML5. Um, is it this one? It'd be interesting if it's actually still up there because I just plopped it up and then forgot about it. Oh, it's still up there. Okay, so that was just a physics thing. Uh, 
So th this is one of those ones where you have, you, I don't know if you do it, but you, you, you do, a, uh, do a project plan for a unit and you have these grand designs and then you find you've only got one semester to do it in and, and other things. So I actually got a lot more completed artwork for this one, so it actually uh, got a bit more uh, dialogue screenshots. Remember where I put it. Projects. Ah, oh, sorry. It is. Nope. Sorry. Just gotta figure out where I put it. Engine shop. I forgot where it is. Uh, actually, no. If I go back there. Ah, there we go. All right. So this is completely JavaScript, HTML5. Um, it uses uh, object orientated. So I've actually created um, a structure where it's inherited. So um, something I sort of showed off the other. It's got the touching. I think it's touch, touch, touch. Um, and yeah, this is what I was able to achieve. The idea was I was actually going to try and like a yes, left and right. Actually, hard to do with left and right keys because it actually doesn't let you. But on on the phone, so what I'm going to actually do is bring up Air Server. Where's Air Server? Air Server. So I might actually show you it on the actual device. Uh, where is it? Sorry, clean that up. Okay. Uh, okay, so is that moving? Whoa, that's some bad lag. Okay, so he's, he's a bit laggy. This work better when I present it uh, at Create World. So this is something that you showed up at Create World. And yeah, it was a portal thing. So that was the uh, concept with this is that you go through the portals and you have all these little worlds floating off in space. Um, obviously only achieved, I think I achieved, I think I have another little planet around here somewhere. Yeah, so there's like a little planet sitting off in space. Um, but it, it, it le, le, it's less about the game and more that it's achievable um, on uh, HTML5. And while that's pretty frame skippy, it's actually playing full speed. And it actually was playing full speed on at least two generations back of iPhones and that. So, because I don't know if you know this, but a lot of people sort of they sort of think it web's not capable. So this was, a, a, I suppose, a, a project to sort of determine whether that was or not. Um, but yeah, as, as you can see, it's a lot of work to um, build an entire engine, and which is why SpriteKit is so approachable because the engine's already there. You just got to figure out things like physics and. Xcode and and that. So um, yeah, I don't know if everyone is aware of this, but there is a closing at I think it's 4:15, and it actually goes for 15 minutes down in the main theater. So um, yeah, make sure you hit that before you run off to weather. So thank you.